Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, today is Monday, April 19th, and this is our 6.30 p.m. budget workshop. Um, again, thank you, everybody, for uh, people who may be in the back. Um, we're glad you're here. Uh, if everybody could do me a favor and please turn your phones off or place them in airplane mode, and please stand and join me to, for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge I allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag, flag of, of the United, United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everybody. Okay, Pam, can you please take roll? I can. President McFarland? Here. Vice President Roush? Here. Secretary Singer? Here. Treasurer Lauterbach? Here. Member Baker? Here. Member Blasey? Here. Member Hatfield? Here. All accounted for. Thank you. Uh, is the volume okay on this? I don't know if the microphone is. Are we getting a good feed? Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, do we have any requests to address the board regarding the budget workshop? Item 2.2. I'm sorry, item 2. Hearing none. Okay, we'll move right into item 3. This is board discussion and prioritization of the 2021-2022 general fund budget. Mr. Bruton. Yeah, thank you, President McFarland. I appreciate it. And thank you, Board of Education, for the opportunity to present our annual budget workshop for you. And um, before we get rolling, really, the budget workshop, as a reminder, has three intentions to it. Uh, the first intention is to give you a reminder or an update on what our current budget status is. And that includes uh, subtext number two, which is kind of a budget history as well. And then finally, number three is what everyone really is most interested in, is a first glance at what we think next year might look like for Midland Public Schools, really from an expenditure and from a revenue side. And from an expenditure side, we'll be able to give you some decent first looks at what we think next year is gonna look like. Um, unfortunately, from a revenue side, I'm sorry to report that we don't have much to share with you this evening um, for two main reasons. Number one, um, we do not have a budget submission from the House or from the Senate yet. We do have an executive budget that was given to us, but that was um, a couple of months ago before some of the latest stimulus monies came out that we think are gonna shift priorities. And the other main reason that we can't give you very accurate numbers within revenue right now is because of our um, unknown in our enrollment area as well too. And I'll hit those pretty hard when I get into these slides. So um, it'll be a little bit more of an abbreviated version than we've had in the past, but I'll make sure that we're going through um, this thoroughly and answering any questions that you have. Please feel free at any time <coughs> to stop me if you'd like me to elaborate more. And if I get going too fast and you'd like to slow me down and have me focus in on areas, I'm happy to do so as well too. And so we'll kick off with our timeline to remind you where we are in our annual budgetary process. We completed our first budget revision back in January. This is our annual workshop and I will be back to you twice in the month of June. Um, on June the 7th, I'll be here to present to you our first um, hearing on our actual budget proposal. And then on the 21st, we have two action items to approve the budget that I presented to you on June the 7th, and then also to amend our current budget for the final time this year. Um, usually that is just a touch of a tweak, a refinement from what we gave you in January. This year, as I will focus on in a little bit here, you're gonna see some larger swings than anticipated um, because we've had additional rounds of federal revenues come to us which will increase our revenue lines, which is good news um, for us to report for our final budget amendment. So let me get back to one of the original intentions now, and that is to give you a reminder of where we are currently here in Midland Public. This was a slide that was presented to you at budget amendment time, and I wanna spend just a minute or so here um, to remind you the components of our current fund balance. So this slide shows you where our fiscal year 20 audit came out at, that was as of um, July 1st of the previous oh, year. Easy. And our fund balance is comprised of assigned items and unassigned items. Um, assigned items are things like um, are the savings that we've been putting aside for technology replacement, the savings we've been putting aside for copiers in the future. Um, our unassigned items really is our cash flow, um, our piggy bank per se, um, our money for a rainy day, which we talked <coughs> about as a good asset to have for this year. 
If you focus near the bottom, and I know the numbers are hard to see, so I'll just uh, touch on those for you. Our total fund balance at the end of last fiscal year was around $24.48 million, which is around 30% um, of our total expenditures. Our unassigned fund balance came in right at around 24.4%. Um, school districts like to talk a lot about percentages of fund balances, but I would feel bad if I left this slide without saying, be careful about focusing just on percentages. If you have swings in your budget like we will this year that are a bit abnormal, your percentages can change even if you have a good fiscal year. So as an example for that, this year if we do balance our budget in June, um, just because of the amount that our expenditures have raised, um, last year we ended our year with around $81 million in expenditures. This year because of our COVID expenses, we're anticipating going up to the $94 million range. That change in denominator would take our fund balance from around 30% and move it to 26%, even though we didn't dip into our fund balance. So sometimes a dip in your fund balance doesn't mean that you had, or a dip in your fund balance percentage doesn't mean that you had a bad fiscal year. So when we're talking about percentages, sometimes those things can be just a little bit elusive in the way that they're presented. Um, we'll shift a little bit now to history of Midland Public Schools budget. And um, you can see from the trend graph that I've put in front of you um, that we've had a pretty good run. Um, in the last 12 years, we've been able to add to our fund balance um, in six of those years. And you can see that the ending of last fiscal year was the peak of the fund balance, both in percentage and in actual cash that Midland Public has had in its recent history. Um, but you can see that our prediction for this year was that we would have a drop in both percentage and actual cash reserves based on where our last amendment was. But this chart does not take into account um, the last two rounds of federal stimulus money, um, commonly referred to in our circles as ESSER II and ESSER III. And we do believe um, in our initial projections that when we do add our ESSER II funding to this, and if we do get our ESSER III during this fiscal year, that that graph will change and we could either balance and or add to our fund balance again this year. So this was prediction as of June. And once we get a little bit clearer picture of when those additional revenues will come in, um, we believe that this chart will end up looking just a little bit differently. This is a slide that Mr. Cooper integrated into his budget presentation. <coughs> and um, really the colors are the things that we like to focus on here. It gives you a history of the Midland Public Schools budget from where it was adopted to what the final audited change was. And the intent of presenting this slide was to show you that um, you don't always go into the next fiscal year thinking that you're going to have a budget surplus. Um, actually, the, the recent history in MPS budgets, when you look at it as a whole and looking at the past decade, there were more years than not that we were projecting a deficit at the beginning of the year. And we always like to take a look at where we predicted versus where we're going to end up. And we had a good run of ending up better than what our predictions were. And I put note in big red, um, someone's going to be presenting the slide 15 years from now and going, what in the world happened in 2020, 2021? And I'll just urge them to Google this year in history. And then they will <laughs> see um, that there were some very wide fluctuations in what we predicted. Um, someone, will, someone in the future will judge me and say, that was the worst prediction someone's ever made. Well, I beg for forgiveness because we did not know what the budget was going to look like last June when we had to go into this so we were predicting $750 per student cuts at that time and actually our, our revenues now we know have come in um, much more advantageous than we thought before so I will leave those there instead of modifying it and one day we'll have a laugh about what those predictions were and hopefully we'll dial those in a little bit better but before I leave this slide there's one point that we always have to make um, and that is if you can go back on this and look at the orange box in 2008 and 9 in the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 row over, column over, um, our high point in per student revenues was at $8,904. And today we are at $8,651, still $253 per student lower than we were at our highest point. Um, and when we do get a little bit further um, in our budget process in June, I'll show you a slide that shows where we should be based on if we just simply followed the rate of inflation or the consumer price index on what we should be per student. Um, it's always a humbling slide to take hmm. a look at. So I do wanna talk about why we are in such a healthy financial position. 
Um, a couple of slides back, I showed you that our current general fund balance is just above 30%. That is a financial position that is um, actually, to be frank, quite envious of other school districts in the state. We are in a very, very high, healthy financial status, which allowed us to plan for this fiscal year in the way that we did with COVID without knowing the revenues that we were gonna be in. And it's wise for us to reflect upon why that financial status is where it is because we need to be reminded of the moves that were made within Midland Public that got us back into a healthy status. And the first is we need to take a look at enrollment. Um, from 2008 to 2009 to 13, 14, Midland Public Schools is averaging a drop of 235 students per year. And when Mr. Shero explains school finances to people, it really isn't that complicated of a formula. If you take some of the um, nuances out of it, it's number of students we have times the foundation allowance, and that'll give you kind of, you know, where you're going to be financially in terms of revenues. When you're losing 235 students a year and you're making $8,651 per student, you can do your math in your head. That, that's something that's very difficult to keep up with when you do have inflationary costs increasing every single year. Now, when you saw our fund balance chart start to move in a more positive direction, you could trace that from the 14, 15 year to the 19, 20 year, and you could see that that drop of 235 students per year really slowed to almost a net even or a drop of only eight students per year. And why did that happen? I think it's difficult to point to one certain instance or one certain reason that that happened. I would point to strategic programming, such as the addition of Young Five, STEM programming, um, adding IBPYP, our PASS program. Um, we really focused on positive public promotions. And we also focused on um, improving our facilities through bond campaigns as well too. We think that every single strategic move that we made helped slow that enrollment loss, which eventually leads to a little bit of financial health. So I, I'm gonna slow down um, and talk about enrollment because this is one of those revenue factors that is an unknown for us. And I want to give you as clear a picture as I can um, amidst a pandemic. When you look at the MPS enrollment, this visualizes what I told you in the previous slides. You could see that there was a period of time where it was a steady loss of a couple of hundred kids per year which led to some very difficult decisions within Midland Public Schools. And you can see right around that 14, 15 mark where enrollment stabilized for MPS when our financial health started to um, level and increase. You could see that in the COVID-19 year from 20 to 21, I show you a slight increase there, um, what I, or a slight decrease there. What I do wanna point out is that's actually a bit of a false positive, a false reading on this chart. It's a bit of a false reading because the um, state of Michigan gave us a different formula on how to count students this year. This year, they allowed us to put a higher emphasis on our last year enrollments and a lower emphasis on this year. It was actually 75% count of last spring and 25% count of this spring where the vice versa is typically true with even a heavier emphasis on the current year. It's typically 90% the current fall and 10% the previous spring. So when they did that, um, our student enrollment came right around 7,666 kids. If that formula hadn't have happened, then you see there's a much larger fluctuation in the actual number on this graph. And that actually shows a realistic drop of around 300-ish students, depending on the day, because we have some students drop, some students add each and every single day. And so enrollment for us and the pandemic blend and whether or not it's going to continue is something that we continue to monitor. And we've been very, very aggressive in trying to recruit back students um, that have chosen um, a different venue for their education this year. And our principals um, and our enrollment specialists have been aggressively trying to get those students back. To put it in a different light, um, the pandemic blend that I just talked about, the vice versa way that they counted kids, saved Midland Public Schools about $1.85 million in revenues this year. So without that, um, we would have had a little bit more difficult time um, with our financial decisions this year. So that's something that we're gonna have to watch closely into next year. Moving back into the reasons for our current financial health, um, state funding was another big venture for us to um, work our way through. From 08, nine to 13, 14, in addition to losing a couple of hundred students a year, MPS was also averaging a decrease of $113 in revenue per student as well too. 
it really was kind of a double punch, losing students and also losing revenue per student as well too. But from 1415 to 1920, not only was our enrollment stabilizing, but we were averaging increases of $73 per student as well. On top of that, we were blessed by the community to support us in the 2015 bond. And when we have those bond proceeds, that helps offset some of the burden on the general fund for doing some of those projects out of our bank accounts and puts it on to what those bond levies are as well too. So utilization of those funds helped get us to the point that we are today. Um, we'd be remiss if we also didn't talk about um, our employees and what they did to help us during those rough times as well too. Um, from 10, 11 to 16, 17, there were either 0% or concessionary compensation for all employee groups. And we know that that's not something that the Board of Education um, likes to do, but it was something that was necessary during those times to be able to weather um, those double punches that we just talked about. Um, happy to say that raises were restored in 17, 18 for all employee groups and have been um, ever since as well too. And when you get the salary letter in June, you'll see that we're gonna be requesting raises again for all employees. Um, that's something that a healthy fund balance allows you to do, and it's something that's good for us to be able to do to reward our employees for their hard work, especially through these trying times. On top of those major categories, there's also miscellaneous funding decisions, um, financial decisions that have helped us as well too. There was a restructuring of the central office. Um, we implemented a teacher retirement incentive, which helped um, mitigate some of our teacher salary um, costs that we have. Um, we've been very aggressive in procuring grants and we've also been very strategic in using our annual funding and we do bring in variances that have been a bit higher than our normal average as well too. Every single year we bring to you a report that is called State Bulletin 1014 and this is a colorful chart um, that shows you the last four years of how Midland Public Schools ranks in comparison to other school districts and how we expend our funds. So the numbers that you really want to focus on are the ones that are in yellow. Those are from the 1920 year and you'll see in the, in the second to top line highlighted in yellow the number 829. That represents the number of public school districts in Michigan. So there's 829 districts that were in this study and if you take a look at the very bottom right yellow number of 406 that tells you where Midland Public Schools ranks in the total amount of revenues that we brought in per student. If you follow the colors from right to left in that bottom line, it's actually a bit of a sobering statistic. You could see that in 1617, we were 248th out of 830, and in just three years, our rank has moved to 406 out of 829. That's moving very, very quickly, and it's due to a policy that's been the trend lately in how revenues are distributed to schools using something called the 2X formula. That means districts that have a higher foundation allowance like Midland Public Schools receive 50 cents on the dollar in increases per student than other normal districts at the base foundation. So for every dollar they get, Midland Public Schools gets 50 cents, and you can see that that's rapidly moved Midland Public Schools to the middle of the pack in terms of total revenues that we're bringing in. That's not, nothing, that's not anything that we're doing wrong. It's just simply the way that the state funding formula is working in trying to equalize the amount of revenues that are going into each and every single school district. But it's a reminder to us that no longer can we live um, beyond where our means are in terms of revenues because we're quickly getting to where the middle of the pack is. And Brian, when do you think we'll be all caught up on the 2X? Um, it well, depends yeah. how aggressively they do it. Um, I have a spreadsheet that tells me four to five years, okay. and I have one that tells me six to seven, um, but Mike can probably elaborate. I've seen 1.5X, and we've even heard talk of 3X at times as well, too. So probably somewhere in the three to six year range is probably a safe bet. Okay. Hey, Brian, if you go back one slide. Yes, sir. Quick question. So if our rank is Local sources, state sources, looks very consistent from 16, 17, all the way to 1920. Right. 145, 138, 144, 154. And then we go drop down in 672, 679, 688, 690. Very static in that rank as well. So if we take two ranks that are static, how do we slip 25%? That's a great question, Brad. I mean, it actually has to do with the percentage 
in those top two lines that we're getting per student and how that percentage stacks up okay. in comparison to the rest of the state, not the actual dollar amount. Okay. So the bottom line is the actual dollar amount and those top two are the percentages Got and it. how they could stack up to others. Happy to break that down for you a little bit further and show you some of the metrics behind that, but that's a great question. On the next slide, um, the one that we focus on here is the instructional salaries and benefits in the very bottom right corner. And this is where we're showing how much of our dollars per student goes directly into basically the classroom per se. Um, so our rank there, you could see back in 16, 17 was around the 145 mark. And from 145 to 217, that really kind of corresponds to when we did the teacher buyout. So when you had a high dollar amount of salaries moving to more of a younger staff, we saw that movement and you could see that it's been pretty consistent now into that 200s um, as well too. And we expect it really to maintain itself in that 200, low 200 range as well. The next slide is a point of pride slide that we like to share. And this shows how we rank in terms of expenditures in our business and administration and our operations and maintenance in comparison to the state. So in business and administration, you could see that in 1920, we were 784th out of 829. And in operations and maintenance, we were 764th out of 829. So that's a point of pride showing that we are operating in those two areas very, very efficiently in comparison to our peers. But I would like to point out as well too, that this is also an opportunity for us to reflect upon those rankings as well and to um, not feel guilty about adding to either of those entities if needed because our rank is in such an elite category there. And just a, a prime example of that is under the business and administration, you will see next year um, within your budget that we've added um, Mr. Hogan to our ranks as well too. He's considered to be an administrator. So when we make those strategic decisions, um, we're doing it in a spot that we know we are still ranking amongst the elite in the state in terms of how we are operating in terms of efficiencies in those categories. Hey, Brian. Yes, sir. Could you expand on who Mr. Hogan is so people understand we all know who he is, but yes, sir. maybe not everybody else in the world does? Yep, thank you for that reminder. I appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Hogan is our new Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Yep, thank you for that reminder. So moving on now to um, our current status, this is the slide that I presented to you on what our June budget amend, excuse me, our January budget amendment was. And I won't spend much time here because these numbers are not good anymore. Um, these numbers were good as of January. As of today, we know that our revenues have changed. Um, again, because we do have additional federal funds that are coming in through ESSER 2 and through ESSER 3. And once we get into the beginning of June, I'll present to you a slide that will change this. And while we don't know what the exact numbers are right now, we anticipate that those numbers will be very much closer to balance. And with a little bit of luck, it may even be to the good. And we may have another budget surplus this year. But we will continue to refine those numbers for you. And we'll bring you something that's a little bit more accurate of a picture once June time comes. Um, share with these slides for you again. Um, these were COVID-19 related slides. This hasn't changed from the June budget amendment showing that our changes this year, the large fluctuations that I talked about before um, in terms of revenues and expenditures, bringing in $3.5 million um, in revenues and expending almost $6 million more million were directly related to the COVID-19 pandemic and the actions that we took surrounding that. I broke it down in detail for you at the June budget amendment. This is just a reminder of where our, ex where our expenditures aligned. Um, and those were largely to staff stipends and also staff salary and benefit costs as well too that were added due to COVID-19. Um, in the end, we added about $7.8 million in expenditures and almost three quarters of those were related to the COVID-19 plan. And the rest were due to state and federal grants that flow through Ms. Miller Nelson's um, department. So as we look into the future, um, what we are really focused on is trying to predict where our student enrollment numbers are gonna be, what our state and local funding numbers are going to look like, and what we anticipate our grants to look like for our revenues. As I said before, um, student enrollment is gonna be a challenge for us to be able to predict this year, and state and local funding, we always hope to by this time be able to give you a realistic picture of what that looks like and I apologize for not having that for you this evening, but um, they just simply don't exist to be able to give to you. 
For expenditures, we are working rapidly behind the scenes now to anticipate what our personnel costs are gonna be for next year. Um, schools are a human capital business where 85 to 86% of our budget is directly salaries and benefits. So anticipating what those benefit levels are going to cost us and what salary levels are gonna be for our staff at what level of ratio um, our staff is going to be at next year in our schools really decides the majority of our expenditures for next year. And then we have what we call the others, the approximate 15%, which makes up our departmental budgets. Things that you'll be talking about tonight, um, professional development proposals, adoptions for textbooks, um, fees, licenses, technology, um, we call it FF&E or furnishings and equipment, fuel costs, et cetera. That makes up the other 15% of the budget. We have completed our meetings with all of our departments to date, and we are working on entering those numbers in the budget as well too. This fancy chart usually has all columns populated for you. It does not this evening because as I said at the beginning, the Senate and the House have not gotten us their budget proposals yet. We hear rumors that within the next week or two, we may be seeing those. We do have an executive budget, but like I said, this executive budget came out before ESSER II funds had come in. And so some of the things that the executive budget had proposed are already addressed through some of those federal funds. I do want to hit a couple of highlights for you, though. In the Executive 21-22 proposal, you could see at the very top that the executive had proposed an increase of $164 per student, which is good news, but the not good news for Midland Public is that it was at a 2x formula, meaning that we get 50 cents on the dollar for that, or $82 per MPS student. Um, other good news in the executive budget is there was one-time grant funding to make up 70% of the lost funds due to pandemic enrollment drops. So it's good that they were talking about it, whether or not that's, come to, that's gonna come to fruition, we simply don't know at this time. Um, so when the entire executive budget flushed itself through, um, Mr. Cooper used to always say, beware of categoricals, and that's just terms for that they sometimes are doing shell games with the money. Um, if the executive budget were to have passed as proposed, it would have meant a $17 increase per MPS student once all the math was done. So it wasn't a budget that was very favorable to Midland Public Schools. It's better than seeing a negative, but we are very, very hopeful that the next Consumer Revenue Estimating Conference is gonna show higher revenues for the state, and we're hoping that some of these federal funds that came in to the state as well too will help offset and mitigate some of the financial burden and lead to a bigger increase per student for Midland Public. The last thing I'll do for you is run through just a couple of uh, quick scenarios for you to show you what could happen with impacts on the MPS budget. So the first <coughs> scenario is if we have flat per student funding, that's a $0 increase, and we recover two thirds of the students um, that were lost this year because of the pandemic. If that scenario happened, which is the worst case scenario that I'm gonna present to you today, um, you can see in the bottom line, in the bottom right hand corner, it would mean a drop of about a million dollars um, in terms of overall revenues for MPS. If we switch and we make that a $75 per student increase, and we're a bit more optimistic that we're gonna recover three fourths of the students um, that we lost this year because of the pandemic, um, that million dollar loss turns into an $80,000 loss. If I keep going and it becomes a touch more optimistic and it's $125 per student increase, and we still leave the level at three fourths of the students um, coming back to MPS, you can now see that I'm adding about $300,000 of revenues. And I can play with these scenarios all day for you, but you can see how the different changes in per students um, ratio of funding that we get versus the number of students that are enrolled in MPS and how that will impact the revenues that come into MPS. These numbers are a little bit more dialed in for you. They are not perfect, but they are a good reference point um, on expenditure changes or dollars that we're gonna spend next year beyond what are in our current budget. Um, we know with our employees simply stepping, that's mean, meaning gaining years of service. So a teacher goes from year four to year fives and moves within the salary schedule, um, that that is going to lead to about $600,000 in additional expenditures. Salary increases, this reflects all employee groups. It reflects the contract that you'll be voting on for ratification this evening. It also reflects um, similar salary adjustments for all of our employee groups wrapped into that. 
In addition to stepping, our teachers can also change lanes. And in our terminology, that means adding a master's degree or adding credits beyond a master's degree, meaning that they move to a different lane within the salary schedule. Um, that's based on a couple of year average, and it's averaging just under $200,000 per year for movement of employee lanes. Medical costs is, is another unknown. Um, we are not sure if the pandemic is going to have a positive or a negative effect on what our medical costs are. Um, early in the pandemic, we were actually seeing decreased medical costs because elective um, procedures and operations were slowed. Um, and then you saw that kind of tick up, but we also don't know what the added cost of testing on insurance companies is gonna do as well too. So we estimated it at 7% and that 7% to us is about $25,000 shy of half a million dollars. Why 7%? Because that's what our increase was last year. And so if we're just washing that into this year as well too, we're gonna leave that as our safe bet. Um, personnel adjustments would mean adding any staff. Um, on paper right now, we do not have money set aside for that. And then what we call the balance our budget or in our terms, the Bob request is when we meet with departments, what their requests are for increases to their budgets from year to year. And that dollar amount um, might be a little bit higher due to some COVID-19 costs that will continue into next year. But we think that we might have federal revenues to help offset some of those costs as well too. So in the end, when you flush it out, it's gonna be somewhere around $2.86 million in additional expenditures. Um, that number is not going to be wildly off when your next budget comes to you. It will adjust a little bit based on how our staffing levels move through, but it will be close. And so as we refine um, over the next month and a half and bring you our first budget in June, here are the variables that we're gonna to continue to watch. What are the short and long-term of impacts of COVID gonna be? And largely enrollment. I have it bolded for a reason because for us, it's one of the most important numbers in developing a budget and adjusting staffing levels around it. How many are gonna to return to MPS? Is there gonna be another pandemic blend? And are we in a position to time our staffing strategically to be able to meet um, that demand? Mr. Sherrill watches this very, very closely. And just this morning in our administrative meetings, we were watching our staffing levels to make sure that we are not overstaffed, but we're also not understaffed as well too, based on some of the predictions that we have. State and local funding, we're gonna be watching the news for the release of the House and the Senate budget and how the next version of the executive budget comes out as well too. I think I would be foolish if I were to say that I will have a final state budget that is passed and brought to you by my June 7th presentation. I hope that's true, but if history proves itself as the last year or two, I think that that is probably would be a lie if I said it were gonna to come to you. So we'll probably be estimating what those numbers will be again. Um, and if we have an adjustment between the 7th and the 21st, we'll make that adjustment for you. But I think we might be into the fall before I know what those real numbers are. Medical costs we talked about and variance is something that we continue to work to use our current fund strategically on annually as well too. So looking ahead, a rehash of the timeline. The next time that you hear me talk about the budget will be June the 7th. We'll continue to work through this in our FFO committee. Um, you will hear that, our tax rates presented to you on the 7th. On the 21st, um, we will ask you for two actions to approve the actual next fiscal year budget and to change or, and to amend our final budget for this year as well too. Um, so our team, our departments will continue to work diligently to bring you the most accurate numbers that we can. It's proved difficult to do amongst and amidst this pandemic. Um, like I said, someone's gonna look at these numbers and charts in a, in a couple of years and say, what happened during those times? Um, but it has been an interesting, interesting time in the world of finance to navigate. Um, some of the challenges have been thrown at us, but we have a great team that's trying to make the most strategic position, the most strategic decisions that we can to keep MPS in a good financial position so we can keep some of those positive trends that I presented to you earlier um, becoming a staple um, within these presentations as well too. So at this point, I will wrap up. If there's any questions that you have, I'd be happy to entertain them. Hey, Brian, are the 7.8 million that we had to spend for uh, COVID-related expenses. Um, originally, when we started the CARES Act is what we were referencing. That was two million, two and a half million, three million. What did we get for the CARES Act? 600,000 um, in the very first ESSER one. Okay. But then there were other lines that had different definitions to them. Okay. All in all, when you grouped everything before our first amendment in January, we we're about three and a half million dollars. Okay. Yep. All right. Um, for the COVID funds that could be coming, 
Are they still straight funds or are they gonna be percentage based? Anything of 1.5, 2.0, any of that stuff that we could be lesser <coughs> to, to great dollars question. than other people? Um, so for ESSER 2, yep. um, actually I'll go back to this. All of the funds for ESSER 1, ESSER 2, and ESSER 3 were allocated via the Title I formula at the federal level, meaning that the higher poverty rate that your district had, the higher per student amount your district got. So the amount per student that Midland Public is getting for ESSER 2 and ESSER 3 is at a lower per student level than many other districts that are around us. Okay. Um, in the end, for ESSER 2, we are estimating in the neighborhood of around $4 million that will be coming to us and the state had to reserve 10% of those dollars. The rest of those dollars, that $4 million, has 13 subcategories that we can spend it on. And those subcategories vary all the way from um, remediation to professional development related around social emotional learning to paying for extra staff to be able to help mitigate learning loss. It, th there's, there's a lot of flexibility in ESSER 2. ESSER 3, I, I get nervous answering a lot of questions about it because I've seen only certain slides. Um, what I do know is it's going to be somewhere in the five and a half-ish to six million dollar range, but there are a lot more restrictions around those dollars in terms of percentages that you do have to spend on specific things. I know that there are certain set-asides that you're gonna have to do for remediation and for evidence-based learning practices but I do not know yet um, with concrete, firm answers what those percentages are because that money hasn't come to us yet. Currently, we are only allocated 43.6% of our ESSER II. Um, the legislature got in a little bit of a knot um, when they were trying to move through that. So the state has 100% of our funds. Only 43.6% are available for us by application right now. And we're hoping that before the end of the fiscal year, the rest of those funds get released. If the rest of those funds get released, that's where you're gonna see our budget come much closer to balance. If they don't, then there might be a little bit of a, a twist there. We hope, we're hopeful that they will be, um, but nothing is firm at this point. We have multiple years to spend the funds. Okay. So that, those funds exceed our costs, certainly, but that's where Brian talked about federal funds in the few, future may be able to assist us with continued COVID costs. That's correct. But our expenses aren't going away either. They're right. going to keep right. rolling. Mm -hmm. right. You have three years um, from what we hear for ESSER three funds okay. um, from the time that they're allocated. So we're going to have to be very wise in how we spend those funds. So what happens, I think we had this happen once before, maybe not, but we've gone to a June meeting before, correct, where we didn't mm -hmm. have concrete, where they kicked the can down the road again? Yes, Is sir. that? Because there's no that. laws that hold them to making a decision by then. So that we could come back to a June meeting and still not have a total solution? That is the likelihood, and that is usually the case in most years. Uh, Governor Snyder's um, administration did give us budgets five or six years uh, prior to July 1. State budget is October 1, so they often do not get it until August, September. So it is a very speculative budget. We'll go, we'll take the House plan, the Senate plan, the Governor's plan. We'll come up and give you our best prediction, our best prediction on student enrollment, and then October, we'll know the numbers, and then that first budget amendment after the first year is more accurate. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, Brian, thank you for doing an outstanding job to you and your team for keeping us so well informed. Um, I, at this time, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Make a motion to adjourn. Motion, Phil. Second. Second, Pam. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we stand adjourned. <laughs>